Hi, I'm Karsten Baum and I'm going to present our recent work on efficient constant round MPC with identifiable abort and public verifiability. This is joint work with Emanuela Orsini from KU Leuven and Peter Scholl and Eduardo Soria Vasquez from Aarhus University. This paper has been accepted at Crypto 2020. Let me begin by giving you a motivation and high level statement of the problem that we want to solve in our work. Consider the following example where we have uh, four parties, uh, P1 to P4, and the parties want to bid for a certain good. Uh, party one in this example would bid three uh, coins, while party two would bid four coins and so on and so forth. And these parties would, uh, in an ideal setting, send their bids in a sealed envelope to an auctioneer. And this auctioneer would compute a function on these bids by looking into the envelopes and checking uh, how much each party bids. And it would identify, it. in this case, party two uh, was having the highest bid with four coins. And it would then announce to all parties that um, party two has won this uh, bid and that party two bid four coins. In practice, we want to eliminate this so-called trusted third party which is the auctioneer and replace the trusted third party by a secure multi-party computation protocol, which simulates this TTP. Um, here, the MPC protocol would simulate the trusted third party as follows. Due to the correctness guarantee of the MPC protocol, we would know that the uh, simulated uh, trusted third party would output the exact same value as the actual trusted third party. And by the privacy of the MPC protocol, it would be guaranteed uh, that only the highest bid uh, would be announced in the end of the computation and that all other uh, lower bids would remain uh, invisible to uh, a potential adversary. The problem in this setting is uh, that uh, fairness in this setting is not guaranteed. Fairness is a property where we require that if the uh, adversary gets the output of a secure computation, then also the honest parties will get uh, this output. But due to an impossibility resolve by Clee from 1986, we know that if we're in a dishonest majority setting, we can't actually guarantee uh, fairness. And in this setting, as we are here, uh, we would have no uh, honest majority. Uh, fairness is an important property in the setting because consider the following situation. Um, as the protocol is not fair, we would run this auction and the adversary would learn that Alice gave the highest bid and that this was four coins. And afterwards, the protocol aborts. Now, that means that since uh, the honest parties don't know what happened, the best uh, they can do is rerun this auction. But now the adversary has an advantage, namely knowing that Alice would bid uh, four coins and this means that uh, the adversary would be able to unfairly bias uh, such an auction. An alternative to using a fair protocol is what is called a protocol with identifiable abort. Let us compare unfair to identifiable abort here. So in an unfair protocol we would have that the adversary would always learn uh, the output of the computation and either it allows the honest parties to also get this or it denies that the honest parties uh, get the output. Now, in a protocol with identifiable abort, we would still be in the same situation that the adversary always learns the output of the computation, but now either it lets the uh, honest parties get the output as well, or the honest parties at least learn the identity of one of the corrupted parties. And we know that this is actually possible to achieve which existing, with existing cryptography, namely uh, a tweak of the original GNW protocol already achieves this, uh, in particular using a compiler from Ishai et al. from 2014. Our contributions are as follows. We present an actively secure multi-party computation protocol that has this identifiable abort property and runs in a constant number of rounds. Our protocol is proven secure against any static adversary that controls a dishonest majority of parties, but not all parties at the same time. Our protocol has a reasonable overhead over the best existing constant round MPC protocols that do not have identifiable abort. And in addition, we show a transformation that 
also yields public verifiability of the output, meaning that a third party could look at the transcript of the computation and either verify that the output was computed correctly or it could identify a cheater in the computation. And this can be realized using, for example, a bulletin board. Let me mention some work that is related to ours. We are not the first to consider MPC with identifiable abort. In 2014, Ishai et al. presented a, a GMW-style compiler that uh, allows to construct uh, ID MPC from uh, oblivious uh, trans paradise adaptively secure. And uh, their compiler can also be applied to existing constant round protocols and uh, then yields a constant round MPC protocol that has identifiable abort. Um, by, in work by myself, uh, Emanuela and Peter, as well as uh, Spini and uh, Fair, as well as uh, Cunningham Fuller uh, and Jakobov, there were constructions of uh, MPC with identifiable abort from the so-called speeds protocol. Uh, the speeds protocol as such is not constant round, so these protocols are not constant round. And in 2015, uh, Kias et al. gave a construction that achieves a publicly verifiable MPC with identifiable abort uh, based on MISIX. And we'll also show how we compare, compare to this construction and the IOZ14 a bit later. And um, both the IOZ14 and the KZZ15 uh, use uh, zero knowledge in uh, a very crucial way. And uh, these are generally uh, rather inefficient protocols that one yields from that. So these are more feasibility results. In uh, some recent work with David, Dowsley, Nielsen and Erksner, uh, we additionally show that uh, one can also obtain MPC with output independent abort. Uh, this is like MPC with identifiable abort, but there the adversary has to decide on um, whether he uh, wants to reveal the output or not to the uh, honest parties uh, before actually seeing the output. Whereas in our case, the adversary can see the output first and then make a decision. First, let me recap how the compiler by Ishai et al. actually works. In their construction, they take an arbitrary MPC protocol uh, and add a preprocessing phase to it. And this preprocessing is then used to make the overall construction uh, secure with identifiable abort. This preprocessing works as follows. First, um, this preprocessing is independent of the actual inputs uh, that the parties are either going to provide to the MPC protocol. So uh, the observation of Ishai et al. is that this uh, protocol can fully be revealed uh, in case there are any errors. So this preprocessing then works as follows. The parties first commit to a random tape. Then they generate uh, correlated randomness, which in this case means that they uh, preprocess uh, zero knowledge proofs. Then since all the communication runs through a broadcast channel, uh, parties always know if another party sends uh, protocol messages or not. And then if there is any uh, problem in generating this correlated randomness uh, during the preprocessing, then um, the parties just open uh, these commitments that they made to their random tapes. Um, this doesn't reveal any information about the uh, online phase, about the actual inputs, because this is just uh, random values. And then they compare these transcripts uh, together, uh, the, the transcript that was uh, made by all parties with the uh, randomness that they committed to. And um, if everything is consistent, then they punish the party that complained. Otherwise, they identify the cheater this way. And then in the online phase, they run the actual uh, MPC protocol and prove in each step in zero knowledge that uh, the messages are well formed. And this then also allows identifiable abort by simply verifying the zero knowledge proofs. One natural idea uh, in order to obtain MPC with identifiable abort in a constant number of rounds would be to compile a uh, constant round protocols. And these are generally based on the so-called BMR paradigm, which uses garbled circuits. So let me just quickly recap uh, garbled circuits uh, for passively secure two-party computation. This is uh, due to Yao. And here we have two parties, a garbler and uh, an evaluator. That garbler would take the circuit that is supposed to be computed securely, let's call it C, and would uh, garble it and make it uh, unintelligible. This is called Z prime. Then uh, the garbler would send this circuit to the uh, evaluator. And afterwards, um, the parties are going to run an input encoding step, 
where party one outputs in its input, party two outputs inputs uh, its own input, and the output is an encoding of each party's input, which is both then sent to party two, the evaluator, and the uh, evaluator then uses the evaluation algorithm to compute the output of the actual computation. And here, the important point is that this uh, garbled circuit together with the input encodings only reveals the output and no other information. And then, in order to have uh, to also provide Alice with the output, uh, the evaluator would then send the output to Alice. In a multi-party setting, we could do something similar uh, using the following approach. Uh, first, we use a generic MPC protocol, which performs both the garbling step inside the MPC. Uh, this garbling step would then output the garbled circuit, but maybe plus some additional error on top. And then the parties would also use the MPC protocol in order to compute uh, the input encoding step. Now, since both the input encoding and the actual garbling are of constant depth, this gives a constant round protocol if implemented with any arbitrary MPC protocol. And the parties can then each locally use this uh, evaluation to uh, evaluate the circuit on the encoded inputs. Uh, this can always be done locally. And in case there is no error, we would get the guarantee from the uh, multi-party garbled circuits protocol that the correct output would be revealed and otherwise an abort would happen. Uh, in our case, we obviously want that instead of an abort happening, a, a dishonest party will be uh, revealed in this step. One could obviously uh, try to directly compile a constant run protocol with IOZ14 as mentioned before. So uh, let's take as an example the protocol by Hazai, Scholl and Soria Vasquez, which, we is, which is also the core of our construction. And let's compile it with this compiler by Ishai et al. What actually is a disadvantage of this approach? So the first point is that uh, the protocol by Hazai et al. already has a pre-processing step, step, which is uh, in independent of the actual input. So it doesn't make sense to have another round of pre-processing before this, which is also input independent. So one would like to merge these two uh, processes uh, together. Um, also, uh, garbling something means that uh, PRFs need to be evaluated. And this is not just uh, uh, inefficient if done inside multi-party computation, but it would also be inefficient to prove in zero knowledge that uh, one evaluated a PRF correctly. So we would like to avoid this. Um, so if we would directly uh, garble using uh, HSS 17 and then throw the uh, IOZ compiler on top, we would obtain a protocol that would need uh, n squared zero knowledge proofs uh, for each gate that is garbled, uh, where n is the number of parties. Uh, whereas in our constructions, we will not need any zero knowledge proofs whatsoever in order to uh, garble the circuit. Let me now explain to you how we solve this uh, problem based on the protocol by Hazai et al. First, let me uh, recap how to uh, garble an end gauge, which is the core of the garbled circuits approach. There, instead of uh, having the inputs and outputs of a gate in plane, we would replace the input bits of the input wires U and V with uh, bit strings, and we would do the same with the outputs. Uh, that means the uh, zero on the wire U would be uh, replaced by a bit string, a random bit string, <coughs> which we call KU0. And the same for the uh, one on the U uh, wire and the same for V and W respectively. Then um, one would encrypt the uh, outputs of uh, respective bit values uh, under the input keys, meaning uh, we would encrypt the uh, zero um, string on W, meaning we encrypt the output of the gate being zero uh, under inputs being zero or either of the inputs uh, being zero and the other one being one. And we would encrypt the uh, output one under uh, the input keys that uh, correspond to both inputs being one. Then uh, after this encryption process, uh, one would shuffle uh, the table so that uh, during the evaluation one uh, cannot find out uh, which uh, 
uh, the which is actually the current uh, truth value when uh, decrypting this uh, encryptions. In the setting where we have more than two parties, let's say n parties, this gobbling actually works a bit different. Uh, in the example here, we consider the HSS gobbling. Here, instead of a key for each uh, of the zero and one values per wire, we would have a vector of keys uh, that would be the input and the outputs respectively. Meaning that instead of having a, let's say, 128-bit key, we would have a 128-bit key uh, for each of the n parties, uh, and these uh, n 128-bit keys would then make up uh, the whole output key of the actual uh, gobbled gate. And each party uh, in this setting actually provides uh, one part of the keys, meaning that party one provides the first block of this, uh, party two provides the second block, and so on and so forth. And then each of the encryptions actually consists of uh, an encryption of each of the outputs, uh, each of the output blocks uh, under uh, all the different input keys uh, for this respective tooth value. Now creating all of these encryptions, creating all of this garbling uh, is actually happening during a pre-processing phase and is independent of the actual inputs. Um, during the evaluation, what happens is that parties have actual uh, keys with uh, some respective truth values. For example, they have uh, the one key uh, for U and the one key for V, and now they want to obtain uh, the output of the garbled gate. So what the parties do is they uh, then decrypt uh, the output key and uh, use this then as input to, for example, the next end gate. Now, there are two possible output keys that uh, could uh, uh, result from this decryption process. The zero key, which is the uh, key that corresponds to the truth value zero, or uh, the one key. And during the evaluation, as said, uh, the parties decrypt the respective key. In this ca case, this is KW1. Um, using the uh, two input uh, keys that they have. And um, then they need to check if this is actually a correct output key. So they need to check that um, nobody cheated during the garbling process. Uh, if you remember, the garbling might add some error E to uh, the, the whole garbling step because it happens in multi-party. Um, so the parties then, uh, in order to establish correctness, uh, check if the block of the uh, of the key that they provided uh, contains uh, their uh, respective zero or one key. So as mentioned before, in the garbling, um, each party actually provides a uh, block of each key. Party one provides the first one, so many bits, party two, the second. So during the evaluation, each party simply checks if in the decrypted key that they obtain, uh, the, the party one, for example, checks if the first 128 bits of the key correspond to either the zero or the one key that it's uh, provided as part of, uh, of this. And if not, then uh, the parties know that some cheating happened and uh, in the usual HSS evaluations, the parties would then abort. In order to obtain identifiable abort uh, in this, we make the following observation. First, during the gobbling step, uh, the party, each party first generates an additive share of the full encryption of uh, the output key in each row under the different input keys. So here, each party has a, an additive share of um, the output key and it has uh, shares of the individual uh, input keys, and it then generates from this a share of the encryption. And afterwards, each party broadcasts this uh, share of the encryption. In the evaluation, uh, after summing up all the shares, what a party does uh, is uh, to decrypt the output key in the respective row by applying the two input keys that it has. Now, um, we observe that um, this broadcast step uh, actually reveals the shares um, already um, and that 
this does not hurt uh, the security of the overall protocol. Namely, uh, let's say that the parties detect that at a certain gate, um, in a certain row, uh, the decryption doesn't work correctly. Now, if the parties would uh, broadcast the U and the V value that they used in order to generate the encryption, then this doesn't hurt because during the evaluation, uh, each party already holds these as uh, part of their decryption uh, keys that they apply. So this does, not, uh, this does not pose any security issues. And the same applies to the share of, uh, of the output uh, vector that one would obtain because the adversary already knows the correct output that it would get in this setting. So actually, whenever we obtain, uh, whenever we would see an error, in a specific row, all we have to do is to recompute this garbling step in public. In order to be able to do this public reconstruction, um, we have to have the, the parties commit to their shares uh, and then open these commitments uh, before uh, we do this uh, regarbling in public. And this is because the parties could lie about the shares that they used in order to garble uh, their respective gates. So that means that uh, during the pre-processing, we will have that the parties have to uh, commit to the shares uh, that they used in the pre-processing step. And then during the evaluation, we identify the smallest gate where an error occurs. Then the parties uh, decommit the shares uh, that they used uh, in order to gobble the specific uh, row that uh, was decrypted. And then uh, during the recomputation, they uh, find out uh, where uh, an error occurred or if an uh, error occurred at all. And this is then used in order to identify the cheater. For this to work, we obviously need commitments from the pre-processing phase to the individual shares. So we have to modify the HSS uh, pre-processing as follows. First of all, uh, similar to the um, IOZ compiler, we will let every party commit to their random tape. Next, we will run the pre-processing protocol uh, of HSS and we will uh, generate commitments to uh, the individual keys using uh, a broadcast channel. Next, we will check the consistency of uh, the values that were obtained and of the committed values. And then in case of an inconsistency, we can actually open the commitment to the random tapes uh, that were made by every party and similar to uh, the protocol by Ishai et al, simply compare with all the messages that were sent. Again, since this is the pre-processing step and no inputs, no actual inputs uh, of any party were used at this step, this will not uh, break the security. Now, this approach might be intuitively secure, but uh, when one wants to prove this uh, secure based in a, on a simulation-based proof, this is actually not trivial. The problem being that um, the simulator itself obviously does not know the shares of the honest parties. Um, so these shares are hidden by the ideal functionality. But uh, once we open uh, all the messages that are sent in case of an, uh, in case of an abort, uh, these shares will be revealed by the ideal functionality and uh, then the protocol generated is inconsistent. Um, so in case of an abort, there will be an inconsistency between the simulation uh, and the actual protocol. And this is uh, a problem. Now, uh, Ishai et al. solved this by using an adaptively secure uh, protocol in order to generate the preprocessing. This is where the adaptively secure OT comes from. In our case, uh, we circumvent this problem by simply defining the problem away. Our solution is to define the preprocessing functionality as follows. Uh, we say that uh, either the protocol was executed correctly, in such a case an adversary may not abort anymore. He cannot abort anymore in uh, practice, actually. So in this case, the honest parties obtain uh, the shares from the ideal functionality, whereas in case of an abort, uh, the shares were never sent to the uh, honest parties. And that means that uh, there is no way of comparing uh, with the values that were sampled in the ideal functionality and there is no need to use an adaptively secure protocol. Now, an alternative to this was uh, recently proposed in another work of myself, uh, David and Dowsley, where we define a uh, so-called Uber simulation, which uh, allows to uh, observe, obtain this UC uh, verifiability uh, in a different way. To conclude, in this talk, I introduced our recent uh, construction of efficient constant run MPC with identifiable abort and public verifiability. 
uh, the challenges uh, that we had faced uh, when constructing this protocol were first of all to deal with this uh, uh, identifiable report and with public verifiability in an efficient way meaning to uh, avoid uh, inefficient uh, techniques such as uh, zero knowledge proofs uh, as much as possible we also uh, eliminated uh, this necessity of having adaptively secure uh, oblivious transfer or adaptively secure preprocessing in order uh, to have this uh, verifiability of the preprocessing phase, uh, which is an additional contribution uh, that we see in our work. Uh, with respect to the work of Hazai et al, um, our overhead are as follows. First of all, during the online phase, we make more use of uh, broadcast than, than they do. Uh, or use of a bulletin board in order to achieve public verifiability, but we can actually reduce uh, this overhead by uh, using an optimistic uh, variant of a protocol. And during the offline phase, we may also have to use more broadcast, except um, uh, we can also reduce this uh, using an optimistic variant of a protocol. And we additionally need to use uh, commitments, or in our case, homomorphic commitments, as mentioned uh, in this talk. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, feel free to contact uh, me or any of the other authors of this work. Thank you.